Trial Lawyers University, where the Titans come to train. Produced and powered by Law Pods. So we're here with Michael Cowan, and we're going to learn about Michael Cowan on trial and how he got to where he is today and his philosophy and every aspect of trial from getting ready to doing that final rebuttal and closing argument. So that's on the, that's on the, that's on the agenda for today. So how are you today, Michael? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I just got back in town from two and a half weeks on the road, but it was a prosperous couple of weeks. I was in Costa Rica for a conference. Nice. And from there straight to straight across the ocean to Miami for the national trial lawyers. And from there straight to Tahoe for a week of skiing. And, you know, like we did like a workshop boot camp up in Tahoe, running out this seven bedroom house and went skiing every day. And, you know, skiing in Tahoe was not ideal. It was a little warm, but skiing in Tahoe was better than sitting in Vegas for the most part. Yeah. Sitting in Vegas is pretty cool too. Cause lots of, you know, now the weather's finally good and it's in the low seventies and Got to get out and hit some golf balls here today. Hopefully later we'll see. We never know. But so much for that. So tell us, tell us, how did you, you know, because you're a partner now and you have a couple partners. What's it, your firm is Cowan. Cowan Rodriguez Peacock. Okay. But it wasn't always that way. So tell us about how you got started in this journey to become the trial lawyer. Sure. I, I didn't think I was going to be a trial lawyer. Well, well I thought I was going to try cases, uh, but I thought I was going to be trying cases for business. I started off in big law out of law school. I clerked on the Fifth Circuit. I had a very traditional path, went up to New York City, worked for a firm called Cadwallard to Wickersham and Taft. But a couple things happened on the road to that big law career path. One is during law school, I got part-time you know, hourly jobs for two plaintiff lawyers just to you know have some beer money while I was in law school. And I really liked and working with you, them. Where'd you go to school? I'm uh, Texas A&M for undergrad, and I went to University of Texas for law school. Okay. And so I really liked working with the plaintiff lawyers more than I liked working in big law. It was more fun. Uh, it was just a more about getting results, not as much about just the hours and you know spending hours and hours proofreading and site checking a memo that was only going to be seen within the office that wasn't even going to be followed anywhere because you can build a client for that. At, at, at huge rates. The other thing that happened is while I was clerking, uh, my judge was, we would go to oral arguments in New Orleans on the Fifth Circuit, but the judge's chambers were in Brownsville, Texas, where I'm from. And I met a girl and fell in love while I was clerking. So I'm up in New York, she's in Brownsville. Uh, she's a very traditional girl, first generation in the US, uh, not going to uh, move up with some guy that she didn't know that well in New York City. So I was looking to, to move back home. I still thought I'd go work for you know a, a corporate defense firm, but I called a magistrate judge that I knew really well, and I said, Judge, these three firms are recruiting me. What do you think of them? And he said, well, this one's not so good. These other two are pretty good. But why don't you call this guy Ed Stapleton? Uh, he knows more about what's going on in the state courts. I've been stuck in federal court for a long time. I said, well, can you call Ed first? Because you know I've only met him once or twice in my life. He said, yeah, I'll call him. So I call Ed. He goes, well, those firms are fine, but you should work for me instead. I won't pay you as much, but I will teach you how to try cases and those other efforts don't know how to try cases. I will let you try cases. They, they'll lie to you. They won't really let you try cases on your own. And I will send you the Jerry Smith Trial Lawyers College and you can't do, go if you defend the insurance companies. And so, you know, I, I was struggling with it. I thought about it. And this sounds weird uh, if you don't believe in divine intervention, but I prayed about it. And it said, God, give me a sign. And so the next day, one of the things when you're in big law, you often like, it's like 5, 5.30, near the end of the day, someone will come and give you an assignment and say, you, gotta, you need to get this done by 10 a.m. So we were trying to get the defense of a Swiss bank that was being sued by a class, action, a class of uh, descendants of Holocaust victims who had put their money in Swiss banks and then got killed in concentration camps, and then the Swiss banks wouldn't give the money back because they didn't have a death certificate. And I had to look up because some of the gold and money got moved to New York because the Swiss were worried about being invaded. I had to research the New York abandoned property law from the time Hitler came to power to the present to see if the banks ever would have had a duty to cheat the money to the state. And so I said, okay, God, I think you've given me a sign. I'm on the wrong side. And I, I took a job as a, as a plaintiff lawyer and haven't, haven't looked back. That was back in 97. All right, so you're looking at 27 years now. Is that right? That's right. Wow. I got, 
I took the bar in 1994, so that's 30 years. That's crazy because I feel so young. It's weird. Yeah, I All took right. it in 95, so we're, we're close. Okay, so, so we, we your first job as a plaintiff lawyer was with Ed Stapleton. Yeah. Now, how many years did you spend with Ed because you're not with Ed anymore? I became partner with Ed, and about two to three years into it, he quit and became a federal public defender, and I was so, suddenly had a law firm right, right before my 29th birthday. And just kind of had to, by then I at least tried some cases, got some good verdicts for the kind of case they were. I mean, I could, every third soft tissue, low property damage, car crash case, I could get between 30 and 100 and everybody else was getting five or 10. Uh, so I started attracting more, more cases and, you know, tried partnering up with different people over the years, had trouble, you know, finding the right fit. Uh, but, uh, you know, so on my own about half the time with other people, associates or partners about half the time until I think 2018, I finally found my forever fit, hopefully with Kevin Rodriguez Peacock. I've got, we've got 10 lawyers. I've got wonderful partners. Uh, we're all aligned. We have similar values. We work together. We work really hard to develop and maintain a firm culture. And we just, we really like each other. And then we're frankly being very successful working together. So it's been a, it's a wonderful, like I'm happy at work. I'm happy coming to work. I love the people I work with. That's pretty important, to say the least, to say the least. So now that you're working, you said you were just, before we got out of here, you said you just um, set to start trial on Monday in Dallas. I am. So this is perfect timing then, because, you know, my first, <laughs> my first topic I want to cover is like the month before trial, the 30 days before trial, what is your process? Yeah, and... I want to be, I'm, I'm going to change your question a little bit because our process actually starts 90 days before trial. Uh, so, and also I'm going to start with the 90 and get to the 30 because you have to do the 90. 30 days before trial is too late to start prepping for trial. Uh, in Texas, we have a, a, anything we want to use at trial, we have to produce 30 days or more before trial. So we start thinking about 30 days, we're out. I mean, it's going to be too late. So, I actually have a report. The way my firm is structured, I have, I, I'm not uh, in charge of the details on any one case as far as like answering discovery, you know, doing motions. I, I come in for the big strategy and trials. I've, I've, I've developed my life the way to do the, only the things I love. Uh, so I get a, I actually get a report uh, just because I want my lawyers to think about these things. So the first question we ask is, have we des designated our before and after witnesses? In other words, do we have people that knew the client even either before or after or both? They could talk, give stories about what happened in their life, and do we need to get more of them? Are those people actually available for trial, or do we need to go take depositions? Do we have to take any other trial depositions? I mean, treating physicians, can they come? Experts, can they come? Or do we need to take their depots? You know, any witness that has a sketching conflict, do we want to take a depot just in case? Do we need to do any additional discovery? Any other depths we need? Any other follow-up RFPs or ROGs we need to send out? You know, do we need to file any Daubert motions, brief any legal issues? What trial visuals do we want to create? What's our visual strategy going to be? And who are we going to get to do the visuals? Are we going to do them in-house? Are we going to hire someone outside? Make sure all our records are in admissible format. Make sure we've produced all the stuff we have that we want to use in discovery. And then anything else we want to do. So we want to be thinking about that stuff at least 90 days before trial so that we have a plan. And then when we're doing our regular meetings, then we're following up, following up. So by 30 days, what I'm really doing is I'm working on, on developing the trial story. So we're you know looking at what is, what is like the, the big story in the case, and then what witnesses and what evidence are we gonna use to put that story together? And then we storyboard it out, you know, who's gonna talk in what order, what witnesses, what facts, in which order. And then we assign, and then we split up who's gonna do what at trial. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You know, it's did, not. Do you do any? Go ahead. Do you do any um, focus groups in the last month of trial? Just to, you know, get warm up your voir dire and your opening. I don't, you know. So, yes, I mean, we we do the the big kind of theme focus groups. Figure out what's you know how to work up the case. We try to do those as early as possible. But then you know we do kind of the depending on the budget of the case. Sometimes we hire people to come in to practice voir dire, to practice opening, make sure people actually get what we're trying to say. Uh, and just to be more comfortable. And then, you know, when it's a smaller case, then we'll, we'll get volunteers from around the office. We'll get people from other firms or other, you know, either lawyers or other people's assistants. It's not as good as getting a demographically representative sample of the jury pool, but something's better than nothing when it comes to practice. So just to give us perspective, because everybody has a different perspective on what's bigger and smaller. So yeah. what would you say is a smaller case where you don't think, where this investment doesn't justify 
the size case doesn't justify a, a focus group. Well, what I look at, well, you can do a focus group on any case. It's just how, how you do it. Do you recruit your own people? Do you hire a consultant? But what I, the question I always ask is, if I spend this money, am I more likely than not going to put more money in my client's pocket at the end of the case? If the answer is yes, then I spend the money. If the answer is no, then I, then I find another way to do it. And so it's really hard to say. I mean, we've done focus groups on $100,000 cases. You know, once you get to the seven-figure case, then you definitely need to be doing focus groups. But even then, I mean, we just created a Facebook page called uh, Texas Jury Research Project, and we could target Facebook ads to the demographics of our uh, wherever we had the case pending and recruit people uh, that way. And they don't know that it's us. They just know it's, you know, Jury Research Project contacting them. And so, you know, we pay a hundred bucks for the Facebook ads. We pay each year 40 bucks. I mean, you can do a, you can do it pretty affordably if you do it yourself. You just have to get the discipline to do a, a real focus group and not try to, you know, oversell your case and undersell the defense case. Let me ask you about, okay, so we're ready for trial. So jury selection or voir dire, give yeah. it, you know, what is your philosophy on that? Yeah, well, my biggest thing I've learned is there's no one way to do it. And I've had people tell me like, only do this or only do that. And they all get good results. Uh, and so to me, the most important thing in jury selection is to establish a relationship with the jury and to hopefully form a group with the jury with hopefully me as like the guide or leader of that group. So I need to be talking. I need to be listening. I need to be respectful and listening and welcoming things I don't agree with. To me, that is the absolutely most important is creating that relationship with the jury. What else I do really depends on the, what my case strategy is, what kind of issues I'm dealing with, and also how much time I have. Because I, some of my courts, you know, we get 30 or 45 minutes for an hour for a death case. It's crazy, but it's just, in others, we don't have a time limit. So you don't have a time limit, you can do a lot more. Uh, so when I have other things, the other th Three things I like to do in jury selection. There's the traditional one, which is I, you try to strike bad jurors for cause. We do, we still do that. I'm not saying we never do. Although I come at it as a more positive thing. I'm looking for my good jurors. So in a mindset, like these are good people. I trust them, not I'm scared of them. And the bad jurors el eliminate themselves. Uh, you know, they identify themselves. When you're looking for the good, the bad identifies itself. The other thing I try to do is I try to elicit principles. Mallory and my partner and I tried a product liability, got a case, got a nice verdict. And one of the questions I ask is like, what do you expect a company to do if they know that people are getting seriously injured in one of their products? And they're like, well, they need to fix it. They need to recall it. And then, well, playing devil's advocate, what if the people that were using the product, weren't using it perfectly. They weren't following the directions exactly, but they still were, you know, every, every week or two, somebody else was getting a serious injury. Well, that doesn't matter. You still need to fix it. So I had that theme in my case and I got, it came from them first. The third thing uh, that I like to do is to kind of elicit witness testimony. And it's kind of luck of the draw, but it almost always happens. And so let's say you have a case where there's not a lot of property damage to the vehicle. So I'll get the panel and say, okay, who here has ever, you know, either yourself or somebody you know, they've been in a crash and the car's all smashed up, but everyone's okay. You always have hands go up with that. You know, and I said, well, tell me about it. You have one or two stories. Let's talk about the opposite. Has anyone, either you or someone you know, you've been in a crash and the cars don't look that bad. Like maybe you could barely tell they're in a wreck, but someone got hurt. Nine times out of 10, at least one juror, either them or someone in their family has been in a crash with almost no property damage and they've gotten back surgery and been in pain for the rest of their life because that's what happens in the real world and so now when the defense says that doesn't happen they bring their biomechanical you know paid opinion witness to say oh you can't get this injury well they've already heard a real person who's got no skin in the game that happened to them and so i think those stories are really powerful we're not allowed to in texas to elicit to, to re refer to them again while we're in closing but they all heard it and and, and it just it it it, what we want to do is just contrast the jurors with the reality. The other, th the other thing I do is, you know, a lot of these defense experts say, well, you cannot get a herniated disc in a rear end collision. You cannot get a herniated disc by lifting something up. They just say it's, me bio it's mechanic biomechanically impossible. So I said, jurors, do you or anyone you know ever, you know, been lifting something and you get a slip disc or herniated disc and you tell me about that. You get the stories of someone that's at work and then all of a sudden they're permanently disabled. They lost their job, how horrible it was. Why would a rear end collision? And you, again, you fear someone got rear ended. And then you get the person the defense was paying to say, that's impossible. That couldn't happen. That person can't be telling the truth. And so now, you know, you can use that when you're later on in closing to say, look, if this company can get away with hiring these people 
to come in and say things that aren't true, no one is safe. I mean, not just my client, but you know, anyone that's at work, they're lifting something, they blow out their back, they have to back surgery, they're disabled for life. Well, they get nothing because they can just hire Dr. So-and-so to say it can't happen. Someone stopped at a red light, an 18 winter comes and plows into them, they're par you know, they get a herniated disc, the surgery, can't work again. Well, they can just hire a doctor and doc so-and-so get away with it. No one's safe if they can get away with this, but you could put a stop to it. And so, you know, now you've gone from a low impact case where someone just made like a, wasn't paying attention and tapped somebody they admit to liability. Now you've got a billet. Now you've got someone paying money to someone to lie and the jury knows it's a lie because they've heard from the other jurors in Bordier Dyer that that's not what happens in the real world. Let me ask you about money. How do you talk about, do you talk about the amount of money you want in jury selection? And if you do, how do you mention it? Absolutely. Uh, two ways. One, we just, you know, in this case, you know, it's going to sound like a lot of money now, but when you've heard the evidence, you understand why, why, you know, this case is good. We're going to ask you to consider an amount up to $30 million, for example. And you say, is anyone just hearing that number? You absolutely cannot consider such a number. And in Texas, we actually have a case that says, if someone says that no matter what the evidence is, they could not consider that number, we can strike them for cause and a lot of judges are following. So no. We don't want to get these strikes for cause, but I want to make sure that they get it, that number out of the way. It's going to, sh they're going to be shocked the first time they hear it, but I want them to hear it in voir dire. I want them to hear it in opening so that when we say it in closing, they've already measured all the evidence against it. Uh, and it's, it's just kind of, it sets the bar, even if they don't give the whole thing, at least that's what they're, they're coming down from. It's really important to anchor early. And it's also important if you believe it, you have to, like, if you're scared to say your number, then you don't believe it. And if you don't believe it, you shouldn't be trying the case. Or asking for it. I mean, is your client typically in the courtroom when you're conducting voir dire? No. Most of the time, I have some clients that insist on it. I like my client in the courtroom as little as possible. And what would you say? How do you um, the burden of proof? Is most people so? How do you talk about the burden of proof in voir dire? I don't always talk about the burden of proof. And when I do, it's more of a way to get cause challenges because I don't think that jurors really apply the burden of proof. And I think they're confused by it anyway. And I think either they believe you or they don't. I, I think they don't really often say, well, I'm not quite sure. I think you're probably hurt. So I'm gonna give you $30 million. I mean, usually you have to really convince them. But the two things I do is, you know, you get someone that you talk about, usually it's the non-economic damage. Like, could, could you award a number other than zero or I'd say allow a number other than zero for physical pain. And they say, well, I can give lost wages. I know you can give lost wages, you can give medical bills, but I'm just talking about just the pain. Could you give a number? Well, I guess I could. And then you bring it back. Well, the burden of proof is more likely than not. So even if you're like, well, there's evidence that she's, she says she's in pain, you know, her friends say she's in pain, but I'm not quite sure. I think she's probably in pain, more likely than not in pain, but I'm not 100% sure. Could you allow damages for that pain? And you get a lot of people, no, I can't. The other thing I do, I stole it from Keith Mitnick's, you know, he put it in a book, so I guess it's not stealing, but he's got that phrase, doubt is not an out. I like to, at the end of my board dire part on the burden of proof, I will bring up that doubt is not an out. And so that way, when I go back to closing, just remember if someone says, well, it could have been, well, maybe you can go back and tell them doubt is not an out. Uh, you know, it's more likely than not. All right. Let's move on to opening statement. Yes. And, you know, how you approach opening statement and, you know, what do you think some of the key things are to accomplish in it? Yeah, well, the big thing is your opening needs to go with the theme of your case. And your theme of the case, I mean, really, if you want to get a good verdict, there has to be a wrong that the jury needs to write. And it has to be something that's, you know, about the jurors. So the case cannot just be about your client. The case has to somehow become about the jurors. So you have to really think about you know, why is this case important to jurors? Why, you know, you want to make them heroes. Uh, I, I love Carl Bettinger's book, 12 Heroes, One, one Voice, Changed My Life. And uh, Sergeant Almott's got one too, From Hostage to Hero, that's helped a lot. But Carl's is really the one that set me on, on this journey to really re un getting a better understanding of, of what I'm doing in trial and what the dynamics are. And so your trial story has to be, a, you know, really about the story of what the defendant did wrong. You know, so if you've got a good contested liability case, which is what I really like, and you can show the defendant did a lot of bad things, especially if it's a corporate defendant that knew for years about a safety problem, ignored it, and then something bad happened, that's a great story to tell. And so that's the story I want to tell. And so example from our last product, I mean, I, I got up and started with our theme, which is, you know, 
manufacturers must, must design their products so that a simple mistake does not have catastrophic consequences. And then gave the whole story about how the, how the company knew for 30 years that people were losing their legs on stand-up forklifts, that they had ways to fix it and they chose not to, and that they never in 30 years assigned one person to solve the problem, spent one cent of corporate money to solve the problem, and said they spent millions of dollars designing defense and lawsuits. That was that case. It wasn't really about my client, it was about the company. If I have an admitted liability case, that's tougher. Like, how do you find the villain? And so I really sit back like, why am I mad at the defense other than the fact that they want to give me money? Because that's personal. The, well, the jury doesn't care if I make money or not. They probably would rather I don't, uh, a plaintiff lawyer. And so, like, what are they doing that is, I, I've done a lot of research into, like, what makes a villain. I've, I've done a lot of stuff into, you know, story, story writing, film writing, that kind of literature to figure out, like, what is it in our society that we identify as the bad guy or the villain? And there's four things. There's being deceptive, there's being immoral, and then a, a good villain's intelligent and powerful. So I'm looking for someone intelligent and powerful, which is often not the defendant driver, that is being deceptive and being immoral. So oftentimes it's like, you know, someone rearing someone and hurts them, they owe them money. Rather than paying them money, they're hiring all these people. They go to, I call it the excuse factory. They go to the excuse factory and they pay a doctor that just rubber stamps, you know, degenerative, degenerative, degenerative pre-existing, pre-existing, pre-existing on every one of the hundreds of cases a month he looks at, and they're paying someone to say something that's not true. I mean, you have to word it differently so the jury comes to that conclusion, but then you have a villain in the story rather than my client maybe being the villain as, you know, this person got in a wreck and they saw a doctor and I saw a lawyer who sent him to the friendly doctor and got him to overtreat. Then we're the villain in the story. So you really need to try to, to craft your opening so that the jury concludes on their own that the defense is the bad guy and they need to do something about it, or if not, they could be next, or their loved ones could be next. You'd think those lawyers in New York a couple of days ago had a decent villain to go after. I don't comment on politics because I, I love all my jurors, and I'm in Texas, <laughs> and I've had uh, I've had jurors that wear ha red hats, give justice, uh, and so. Yep. I'm only commenting on the villain part when you said deceptive, amoral, powerful, and what's the last one? Uh, intelligent. Three out of four in bed. Intel oh, okay, forget <laughs> it. We don't have a good verb. I'm sorry. I'm, I, we don't, we no longer have a good, that, that, that was, I was thinking about somebody different now. Yeah. So, um, I was going to say here, I, oh, cause you talked about the villain here. Cause that reminded me, cause in Huntington Beach, June 5th through 8th, we're doing a, uh, a beach conference down at the Pasea Hotel. And I know you're going to be coming and you're going to be teaching something about the villains, aren't you? Yeah. What I want to teach about is how to make how to structure your trial story so that the company is the villain. And that could be really challenging in states like California, where if the company admits that their employees in the course and scope of employment, a lot of times your negligent hiring, negligent training cases go away, uh, claims go away. Uh, I think it's the, I forgot the name of the, I know the name of the case and I forgot it in California. And there's uh, some other states have that same rule. So I want to talk about it both when you, you know, how you, plead and prove and get the evidence you need in California and other states to tell that story. And then if you can't tell the story, the judge says, you're not going to get into all that thing. How you frame your case with language, with structure, uh, with visuals to keep the focus on the defendant and, and make the defendant the bad guy. That's, I, that's really been a lot of the focus of, of my research and, and development of the last five years. It's like you are a, uh, you know, a, perpetual learner and Absolutely. researcher it appears and so how would you say you know because you mentioned this just on a side note on the spence meth or jerry spence college and sorry de lamont so how would you say those two forces influenced how you're you know doing the voir dire and openings these days yeah well i was lucky enough to go to the trial lawyers college in 1998 uh, i got in really early so i i never learned to try cases another way i mean other than if you count mock trial in law school but i i I learned, I guess, a, a good way to try cases from the beginning. It took me a few years, I think, to develop emotionally enough to be fully open enough to fully embrace all the things you need to do to fully embrace that method. I think I was still a little closed off as far as being totally, you know, I'm still working on being totally myself and, and open and honest, but uh, definitely I'm a lot further along at 53 than I was at 28 or 29. So the, uh, I think that was a great influence, you know, taught me how to talk to a jury, taught me, you know, how to frame a case, how to do a, a cross. I mean, it's been a great thing that I've been able to do that. 
but there's always another level. And what I found is like every consultant can teach you something and you, you, you take from it and you eventually, you know, I see a lot of people, it's like, well, I'm just going to do the reptile. And, you know, I've got one co-counselor right now. Well, how's this fit in the reptile? It's like, dude, I love you, but it, it doesn't, you know, uh, you know, how does this fit in whatever other method? Well, I love you, but it doesn't. This is my method. Cause I've studied from all these different people and I've tried a bunch of cases and I found these things work for me and these things don't. And some things, I mean, I've seen the verdicts, I've read the transcripts, they work really well for other people, but they don't work for me. Uh, and so it's just, and then Sari has been groundbreaking because she's really, I, I didn't just work, I've worked with Sari. I didn't just read her book. I mean, I, I did like a VIP coaching program with her where I've been up there practicing with her where she videotapes me and gives me uh, feedback on my body language, my tone of voice, eye contact. But then she's worked with me a lot on mindset and so for me, the biggest thing is, you know, one, learning to have fun. I had to finally come to the realization that I have no control over the outcome of the trial because I'm not in the jury room and I can't vote and I can't be in there in the deliberations. So all I can do is give the jurors what the tools they need to maximize my chance of winning. And then I just have to trust them to do it. So I trust them to do their job. So before every trial of a mantra, I said, I'm going to I'm going to trust the jury. These are good people. They're taking time out of their lives because they want to do the right thing. And so as long as I, I give them what they need, they're going to do the right thing. Whether that ends up being true or not, if I tell myself that, I'm more, I'm more real and more relatable to the jury. I tell myself, now the judge, he or she is on the bench because they want to make the right rulings, and they're going to make the rulings that they think are right under the, the law. They're not going to do it because of favoritism. They're, and I might not agree with it, but they're doing what they think is right, and I'm going to respect it and not argue with it. And I want to have fun because, you know, I am blessed to be able to do this. I mean, this is to be able to go in there and try cases is so fun. I'm just going to be grateful for this opportunity and I'm going to have as much fun as I can when I'm in there. And once I really started embracing that and, and started believing it, I just tell myself that and tell my team that every morning we're going to trust the jury. We're going to trust the judge. We're going to have fun and trials become more fun. And then our results have gotten better. I mean, because then when we're not all, when you distrust somebody subconsciously, it, it screws up your ability to persuade them. When you trust them, then you're more relatable, you're more real, you're not as nervous. It just works a lot better. And so, yes, yes she's done a lot of things with body language. It's helped me to get to talk more, to learn. Like, like Josh Garden taught me how to make eye contact. Sorry taught me when I don't need to make eye contact, you know, when it's too much. And, and when I want the jury to look at something, I need to be looking. So I want the jury to look at a visual. I can't be staring at them and say, look over there at that visual. I need to be looking at the visual with the jury. We're doing this together. Things like that. So there's, you know, like I said, I've learned a ton from Judge Carton. I've done a, learned a ton from Sardi Lamott, all the different trial consultants. Learned something from each of them, and, uh, and I'm grateful. But then you, then you have to go put it all together to say what works for me. And the only way you do that is to go try cases. And, you know, sometimes you're going to fall on, you know, fall on your face and sometimes you're going to do great and you just have to get up and go on to the next one. Resilience is the word of the day. Resilience. Absolutely. Because, you know, the fact is you can try a perfect case and you can screw up the trial and be underprepared and win. I mean, there's all kinds, there's so many dynamics that come into trial and frankly, the facts matter. And, you know, who you, who you end up getting on the jury matters and you don't, you know, you only have so many strikes. You don't have total control of that. And, you know, what the other side does matters. They, they get a voice in this too. And so you just have to go in there and you have to give it everything you have and then just trust the jury and accept the outcome. And if you don't like it, yeah, I mean, I guess you can appeal, but you, you mentally, you move on to the next case. And, you know, I give myself one 24 hours to mourn and that's it. And then I'm on to the, I usually open up a really nice bottle of red wine, have a few drinks get a good night's sleep, go up and get back to work. What's the next, the next case, the next client? You know, that's all you can do. Yeah. Let's talk about direct examination. And how do you think about order before we talk about how you actually execute it? Tell us about your, your thoughts on the order of proof and who you want to start with and how you want to sequence your witnesses is between liability and damages. Yeah. Well, the first thing is I think you have to establish that the defendant needs to pay money before you start going to damages or I'm really worried about the jurors thinking that we're just seeking sympathy, uh, especially I think with a catastrophic injury or death. I mean, if, if you just start falling on their heartstrings, your defense laying jurors are going to get really suspicious. Like, Oh, okay, here they go. But if you get them mad at the defendant first and they're like, Oh my gosh, look what they did to these poor people. 
So I think it, it's important to establish your liability case before you start putting on damage witnesses. The other thing is you have to think about, do I need to teach the jury something for them to understand and fully process the liability theory? So the, for example, the product case that Mallory and I tried in August and September, you know, the jurors didn't know how to design a product. So before we started talking about what the jurors did wrong, we had a witness teach the teach the jury the steps of designing a product, which is, you know, you got to look at what can go wrong and how bad of, of arm it, it, you know, what's, what's going to happen if these things go wrong. And then can you design out this danger? Is there a way to, you know, it's design guard warrant. Can you design out the danger and make, and make the product work without that danger of people getting hurt? If you can't, can you put a guard or somehow try to prevent the danger? And only if those two things be, don't work, you know, then you can put a warning on it. And, you know, we have the expert talk about that, but it, we don't we just want his word for it. We want things called anchors. We want, like, neutral, authoritative, written sources showing that we're not just making it up, that this is what happens in the real world. In this case, we also were lucky enough that the defense, the engineer that designed the product admitted that those were the rules. So we had what's called a talkie. We had a poster with a picture of him and the quote where he, you know, so even the defense agrees with these rules. Then we tell the story of what the defense did wrong, which is, you know, that there's, there's this danger on these forklifts. How long have they known about it? All the, you know, all the stats, all the people that have been hurt. And then we went into what happened in our case as far as our guy losing the leg, and not until we established all that did we go into, into damages. So talking about these different witnesses, those, so the expert witnesses, you know, do you have a, you know, a way that you go about you know, kind of preparing them and putting together their direct I do. structure? Uh, first of all, I, I don't go into their qualifications nearly as much as I used to because if, if you spend 15 or 20 minutes going to qualifications, the jury's bored with it. I mean, they want you to get to the point. Uh, if I think I need to get it in for Daubert wow. or appellate purposes, I'll, I'll bring it in at the end. I'll, I'll tell the whole story and just say, by the way, I mean, we, we, we've heard your testimony, but just because, you know, this thing might go up on appeal, I need to ask you a few more questions about your background. I mean, just basically let the jury, you can tune out now. This is for somebody else. Uh, but a little bit on qualifications. I think it's really important that, a jury, that the expert teach the method that they use before they apply it. And I think it's super important that they, uh, right did you call some anchors, that you, you have something that they anchor their opinions and their methodology to. So, you know, I do a lot of trucking, so I want the, you know, next week I'm talking about, you know, what you do if you start using air pressure in your brakes. I mean, you, you don't do what the defendant did, which is stop in the middle of a dark highway and don't put on your hazards. But, I mean, you, you need to monitor, you know, this is how the brake system works. And if the air starts going out, the brakes are eventually going to start locking up and your vehicle is going to come to a stop. So you need to look at your gauges, and this is the, this is the part, you know, the, either the driving textbook or the commercial driver's license manual that says you need to look at your gauges. This is the warning light that comes on. When that happens, you need to pull over to the side of the road. This is where it says that. If you do get stuck in the road, you need to put on your flashers. This is where it says that. You got to put out your triangle. But I, I want, I always want to have that anchor, because jurors don't put a lot of credence into the word of someone who's being paid to be there. But you can't cross examine a book. And the defense hates bringing anchors because they want their experts want to be able to say whatever they whatever they want whatever the defense needs in every case, and so usually like it's it's us plus the authorities versus just the word of someone the defense pays, and so to me that's really important. So we we set up what the rules are, you know, what the d defendant's process is, and then we go into what the defendant did wrong for a liability expert. But same for you know medical expert, like how do you do a diagnosis, you know, what, you know, you know how do you figure out whether or not an injury was caused by a crash or whether it was pre-existing. What are the steps you need to do to do that? Now let's go through and talk about what you did and, and what the significance of what you found was, and then let's come to your conclusion. Let's talk about your plaintiff. What, you know, what do you do to prepare your plaintiff and what's your philosophy on putting up your plaintiff and when to put them up? Yeah. I almost always put on the plaintiff. I, I, I have one case, uh, it's settled right before. I, I wish I had board out on not putting up, up. it was a TBI case. Uh, I think on a TBI case, if I could not put up my plan up, I probably next time won't. But the, in general, we do put them up. What I want my, my plaintiffs to do though, is to tell the story of how they struggled to overcome what's been done to them. I, I want them to trust the other, what I call before and after witnesses to tell most of the damages story. And I want them to tell the story of resilience and hope. And I want them to be fairly short when I can. Now, there's sometimes you don't have good enough 
other damage witnesses, and you have to go into a little bit more. So you, you know, they have to talk about that they have pain. They have to say that. They have to talk about what their limitations are, but also to, to spend more time talking about these are the things I've done to try to get better. These are the things I do that even though it's going to hurt me when I do them and I want to pay for it afterwards, I still want to live my life, so I'm doing everything I can. Because you need hope. The jury is more likely to give money if there's hope and the money would do well. You know, if you just have like, I'm in terrible pain for the rest of my life. I can never do anything no matter what. Well, then why give, me, why give you any money? What good's it going to do? You know, if, if you have someone that's doing their part and doing everything they can, and just learning to trust the other people to tell the rest of your damages story for you, I think it works out a lot better. And to, speaking of these other people, those we call our before and after witnesses. Yeah. And so give us your thoughts on those. Yeah. The, and, the pre- and the preparation for them too. Yeah. So it's clients different. don't get it. I mean, clients think that the person has to know everything. They have to know what happened in the wreck. They have to know them before. They, know, they have to know them after. So we actually start this process. I'm militant about this at my firm. Uh, and, and one of our rules is like, we have a 10, 10 commandments, which are our minimum standards for litigation, is when we first disclose any type of witness, like in federal court when we do our initial disclosures, you must list before and after witnesses from the very get-go. You must get them. So part of our script for our initial client meetings is to explain before and after witnesses and to ask them about them. Part of our assignment to the paralegals when they do the mo- monthly client contact calls is to go over the list of before and after witnesses, again, explain it to them, and try to get more. Because they just, you know, you, you have to get it through their head that it could be someone that knew you before and hasn't seen you since. It could be someone that, that you worked with afterwards. It, you know, it's great to have someone that was both and have the comparison, but we just need to get these people to tell their stories. And so what I usually do end up doing, once I convince them that, look, no one's going to believe you if you don't have someone to back you up because you're asking for money, is like I ask kind of three questions. It's like, what did you love to do before? What were the things in life that brought you joy? Well, who did you love to do those things with? Who did you do this? So, oh, I love to play basketball. Who did you play basketball with? You know, how often did you play basketball? I love to go fishing. Who did you go fishing with? Well, let's identify those people. You think any of those people might be willing to come and, and testify you, for you? And then what we'd want to do, we don't just want their testimony. We, we really want pictures and videos. And so, like, well, do you have any pictures of you fishing with these people? And usually, no. But when you talk to the before and after witnesses, like, if, if you want to find pictures of me, don't look at my phone. You look at my wife's phone. You look at my kid's phone. You look at my, my partner's phone. They're the ones taking pictures of me. So when you meet these before and after witnesses, hey, do you have any, you know, oh yeah, we used to love to go do, you know, go on hikes. Would you have any pictures of you hiking with that person? Well, yeah, I do. And then, you know, so the pictures bring it to life. It helps nervous witnesses tell the story when they have a visual, but it also just makes it real because you have a photo that it happened. And we just have to keep working with them. I find when I meet with my client and the before and after witnesses together at my client's house, when we're in the living room or around the kitchen table and they're comfortable and then the stories go and... You know, they say, oh, well, you're getting, you know, the defense will criticize. Well, you're meeting everyone together, trying to get their story straight. I'll take that because when they start talking, they, you jog each other's memory. Hey, remember when this happened? Oh, yeah. Well, remember when that happened? Hey, just said, I don't have a picture of that, but I bet my cousin does because she was there too. And, or let's go look at so-and-so's Instagram. I, I think they had a picture there. I think I remember seeing one two years ago. And those meetings in the client's living room, the client's house bear so much fruit that it's just really, I will not try a case without going to the client's house and spending some time with them and with the before and after witnesses there. It's just, it's a, it's, you, you get so much more of that than you'd ever get in a month of meeting with people in your office. So let's transition to the other side of the coin, the cross-examination. And, and uh, as a criminal defense lawyer or a former one, I say, I've got a lot of practice in the, the cross-examination and and studied it a lot. And, you know, like on during the pandemic, I had Roger Dodd on probably 20 times. I don't know if you ever read the book, Cross-Examination, Science and Technique. Well, just want to make sure you're up on your reading. You got all these other people. And, uh, but as like, I learned so much from him on cross and cause, you know, cause we do all these, have the videos from CVN of the different trial lawyers and, you know, like Claggett or Lloyd Bell or Freed or whoever. And he would kind of give like a postmortem of it. And it was, uh, it was cause I, I grew up reading his book. You know what I mean? I say grew up, but as soon as I got out of law school, I'd go to the coffee shop every day for like an hour, hour and a half after, after work and just sit there and read and try to like learn this shit. And, uh, so it's kind of like a part that fascinates me more than I guess, uh, than, than direct. So the, your cross, you know, especially these experts are I thought cops were difficult. These people that make a million plus dollars a year, are a little more intelligent than cops. So how do you go about, no, nope. they're more fun. <laughs> they really are. Well, I haven't got to the fun part yet. I'm still working on that part of my 
my trial lawyer. And when it's fun to, you know, we get these people set up. The good thing is you got all this discovery. You can really set them up to knock them down. Yeah. But uh, it is so fun. So, I mean, a few things on cross. One, you have to, for every, if you're going to do a cross, and I'm, yeah, I almost always do cross to the defense witnesses. The, there needs to be a reason. So you have to be thinking it's trials about the jury. What story do I want to tell through this witness? What point do I want to tell through this witness? If all you're doing is destroying the witness, you're not necessarily advancing the ball. And you may lose, like if you're an ass, if you destroy them too hard and you're harsh with them, like you're really nice to your witnesses and you're a total jerk to the defense witnesses, you know, you can look two-faced and turn off the jury. And so what I really think is like, what is the story I can tell through this witness? Now, sometimes the story is this, this witness is lying and being paid a lot of money to lie. That may be the story, and that's okay if that's the story, especially, you know, you can't call a person a liar. You have to, to tell the story in such a way that the jury comes to their own conclusion. Uh, sometimes you can get a witness that's unfriendly with you on one area to go and help you in another area. You know, so the case I have set for trial next week, I mean, they're going to try to blame my guy uh, for running into the back of the 18-wheeler stop at night on the freeway without its hazard lights on and without any triangles. Uh, but I'm going to ask the person, you know, oh, yeah, this won't come out before trial. So he's going to have to admit that 18 wheelers it's safer to pull over the side of the road than to stop in the middle of the road, that, you, that the law requires that you have your four-way hazard lights on, you know, that you're supposed to be looking at your uh, gauges. When, when the buzzer and light come on saying that your air brakes are going to go off, that you need to pull over the side of the road. Uh, I'm going to tell, I'm going to spend more time. I mean, I'm not going to fight with them on whether my client should hit the back of the 18 wheeler or not. That's, I'm not going to win that fight. I'm going to fight with them on the 18 wheeler shouldn't have been there. I'm going to win that fight. And so instead of me just getting in the, in the arguing match with the person, I'm going to, I'm going to tell my story through that witness. I'm just now, now I have to ask like, so this truck just stopped in the middle of the road. Well, what happened is it ran over, it hit some, ran over something and it pulled an airline out in, from the air brake system. On, on, so on the right side, it starts losing air. And so at some point, you're going to see the air pressure gauge is going to start going down. The driver's on the phone, never notice it. And sometime there's a warning light and a buzzer that goes off. The driver keeps driving, never notices it. The driver claims she finally starts feeling something like some deceleration, which is because it's been like a couple minutes that this air has been coming out and the buzzer has been going off. And so she just slams on the brakes and stops in the middle of the road. Then she's got her left turn signal on because she was thinking about switching lanes. Never puts on her hazards. Claims she puts on her hazards, but we have the cop video from the you know drive, the dash cam when they got there. Her hazards aren't on on. Her four-way flashers are not on. And she didn't put out the triangles because she was too scared of getting hit because it's dangerous to be in the middle of the road. And they're denying liability. Yeah. Yes, we get them. That's, see, that's a good. That, that's it. That sounds like a thing you'd have to deny liability on. I got it. Yeah, I'm, I got I'm happy it. about that. They're saying it was a sudden emergency. There's nothing sudden when you get a minute or two. And even yeah, after right. the, the the brakes started going, even after she hit her brakes, I mean, she, all she had to do was move two lanes over and get the shoulder of the road. Yeah, and this wouldn't have happened. How, how about your philo philosophy or tips or pointers on uh, cross examining defendants? Because typically, in most cases, the defendant driver or the defendant, you know whatever the person did the wrong is going to take the stand. Yeah. And so you want to, uh, a couple of things I do is, you know, you, again, you want to tell your story of what the defense did wrong through the defendant. A couple of things I try to do, like I ask them right up front, whether they admit fault or not, because when they deny that, then that gives me the leeway to go into all the other stuff. When they admit it, I don't have to go into all the other stuff. And then you always try to give people the, a, a, a life preserver to blame someone further up the chain. So let's say a truck driver makes a mistake. It's like, well, you know, did they ever teach you about this? Did they ever train you about this? Did they, you know, don't you think that they just would have given you the training that you would have known what to do? I mean, you're in a panic situation. Don't you wish they had done that? If they are giving you the training, wouldn't you have followed it? You know, do you think it's fair to just blame you or do you think your company has some something needs to share in this blame? You know, give them that chance to, they don't always take it, but a lot of people do. You know, when they feel guilty, if they can share the blame, they'll do that. Uh, but again, and the other thing is, you know, you got to be, you got to be nice because, you know, you may have had this person lying and denying responsibility and you're mad at them after, you know, two years of litigation, but the jury just met them. The jury doesn't know all the things that happened before. And so you need to, you know, be nice and let them expose their villainy so the jury gets mad at them. I've heard it said that, the you know, because you sometimes you people on sometimes in cross, 
you know, because I do these like workshops and stuff, teaching presentation, nonverbal communication stuff at my condo here in Vegas. And uh, it seems oftentimes it's cross examination. People just, as soon as it comes, it's like, Argh. it's like, yeah, worst just, thing it's in the, like world. the beast. It, it's so interesting where it's like, I've heard or, that the, uh, yeah, you know, I think the best tone, maybe I got this from Dodd to, to, to have for cross is a tone of disappointment. Like, yeah, I understand you have, but it's, it's just so sad that you have to like lie or, you know, your life is one that you just for money, you have no moral compass. I'm just so it's, it's disappointing. I mean, but we understand. I think a lot of, you know, you reverse roles with the person, you know, you, and, and try to approach it with the like, empathy and love. And, and, uh, you know, what I told the jury, like on this one, like, you know, this company for 30 years has known about this problem and they've not hired one person, you know, they've not assigned one person or spent one cent in research to try to fix the problem. You know, I'm hoping you'll make them do it for, for the good of the company, for the good of the people that use the product. I mean, you don't have to hate them. It's like, I, I, I see it like my, my sons. I mean, I've got two boys and they do, they're growing up. They're going to do things that I don't approve of. Uh, they're going to do bad things. Really? I mean, that's what kids do. I did, you know, and so I have to correct them, but it doesn't mean I don't love them, but I still have to correct. I can't just let them get away with doing it. I, there has to be a consequence or they become horrible people. We don't want that to happen to these experts, right? We don't want to become horrible people. We'll have to correct them. Well, you know, the experts are a little different. I mean, but I mean, I, I'm a lot gentler on the defendant driver. I think the experts, you still want to come across as nice and stuff like that because they are, they're really good at testifying. I, I think the experts, you just have to explo ex expose who they really are, the people that talk for money. They're not, the only thing they're experts in is telling, is telling stories for money to juries. Uh, and then, and just finding ways to expose their deception. And, you know, a lot of it is, you know, I'm a bit of a geek. I read all the papers they cite. And almost invariably, they misrepresent the literature, and it doesn't say what they say it did. And so I bring it up. Or, you know, I use the anchors that are, for a learned treatise, you know, if your expert proves it up as a reliable authority, then you can use it to cross-examine the defense expert. So I do a lot of cross-examination with uh, learned treatises. I mean, our, our forklift case, we were lucky. One of the papers the defense expert said he relied on showed that, you know, hundreds of people per year were, no, that's not, not per year, but hundreds and hundreds of people had lost their legs because of this issue. And that if you put a door on the forklift, the injuries went down to zero. That said in the paper. So he relies on it because there's one little thing in there he liked. But then I got to say, well, when they put the door, the injuries went down to zero. And these other bad things you say would happen from a door don't happen. And can you show a paper that says otherwise? And uh, it really helped. Sounds like based upon the verdict that you, you know, in the case. Yeah. That it helped. Let me ask you about, let's move on to the, everybody's favorite part of trial, supposedly, is the closing argument. And so... You know, your, your thoughts on that. And really, yeah. when do you start preparing your closing? Let's start there. Before trial, really in the week leading up to trial, because I really have to really know my case to prepare the closing. I mean, so, you know, you really, as much as you want to prepare way in advance until you really start, there's always new things you notice and new ideas you get as you're coming up. And it's got to be kind of modified throughout. But I definitely want to have just the basic outline and structure of my closing at least a week before trial. And, uh, Biggest thing on closing is it's not about convincing the jurors because uh, most of them have made up their leaning one way or another. Now, they, they can convince each other in the jury room, but you're probably not going to change someone from defense-oriented to plaintiff-oriented during your closing. I think you can, I, you can possibly help frame their damages, uh, you know, what they're thinking about in damages if they haven't really thought about it. So I, really what you need to do is give your, your jurors the tools they need to fight for your client in the deliberations room. So I think the big thing, you know, don't go through all the evidence in your case. They're going to shut down on you. They've already heard it. They don't want to go hear you rehash. And this witness said that, and this witness said that. I mean, you're just going to lose them. So, you know, start with the big theme of your case and then go through the jury charge. I mean, they've got a job to do. Be, the, be their guide. Be the person that's going to show them exactly how to do the job. So go question by question. This is how you need to answer the case. And this is why, you know, give them a few things that are easy to say if they're taking notes, you know, say, and I'll write this down, uh, that they can do to support the answers that you want to have on each one of those things and save time for rebuttal. I mean, that's the thing. Save as much time as you can get away with for rebuttal because uh, that's where it really comes home after the defense goes. As far as the closing, though, do you... 
do you do a, a jury empowerment in the close, you know, as absolutely. part of your closing? Absolutely. You know, I'm trying to motivate the jurors to do something great. I'm trying to motivate the jurors to be the heroes of the story because I'm not the hero. Uh, I, I can't save the day. Only the jurors can save the day. And so I try to find something in the case that is going to motivate them to go back. And, and I just say, it. I need, I need you to be a hero. I, I wish I could do it, but I can. I've done everything I can. It's your turn now. Uh, you can change the world. You can, you know, you can change an industry. You can make the world safer, whatever it is. If I can get away with it, I'm going to say it. As far as, um, you know, and I assume, like, do you have any idea, like, as far as closing, though, like, time frame? Do you, like, try to make it, you know, and you said you try to keep, like, in, in Texas, where you try most of your cases, they give you a set amount of time for closing, typically, most to divide between. First close and second close? Yeah, most judges give me a, a period of time that I can divide any way I want. I've had as little as 20 minutes, which is really tough. Um, on a on a death case uh, or a catastrophic injury case, I usually get 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, so we don't get super long closings uh, in Texas that I've heard. You know, I've heard of people that give like three-hour openings with all these video clips and stuff. Like I, I get a 30 or 40-minute opening and. I try not to even use that much. I'm, I'm splitting a lot of my closings with my partner, Mallory Peacock, now, too. We, we've been doing, I do liability, she does damages, and it works out really well. We just do the whole trial that way, and I think we each appeal to different people. We're, we have different styles. I mean, a 50-something-year-old man, she's a 30-something-year-old woman. We have different personalities. Uh, we come across different, and so I think that each of us resonate with different jurors. I think the combination of the two of us really works well, and the being able to just focus on one part of the one part of the trial really works well. Uh, you know, we need to come up with some reason for our ass, so we're not just pull, pulling our number out of the air. Texas just got a lot harder because a lot of things used to work, like comparing the value of a piece of art or a fighter jet or what an athlete gets paid or so many cents per mile the trucking company goes. The Texas Supreme Court says that's automatic reversible error. The other side doesn't even have to object. Uh, so we've we've tied it more to like a per diem and kind of you think of like the newspaper ad like if some if you wanted someone to voluntarily do this what would you have to pay them and that seems to work uh, but we're always first trying to think of like how can we what is the logical basis for why a jury should give this much money and if we can't come from one then we I think we need to reestablish our number because we want a big number just because of our ego that's a problem we we need to have a big number because our client deserves a big number because it's merited in the case. Uh, so we just have to do the kind of the thought work and the brainstorming to figure out why that number is the right number. But I always, always, always try to make sure I save time for rebuttal. Right. And let's talk about the rebuttal. You know, what is your approach to rebuttal? And do you, and, and you kind of have your rebuttal prepared before your before the court, before the case starts? Because you have an idea yes. what the defense is going to say. I mean, it's well, not like not just rebuttal. that. My, my rebuttal is not purely a rebuttal. My rebuttal is my last chance to arm the jurors to go back into the jury room and help. And so I usually try to save like five to 10 minutes of it for a rebutting thing. Like, Cause I'm, when I'm hearing the defense giving their closing and I know they're full of, you know, they're misrepresenting something. You know, I'm taking a bunch of notes, but then I have to like be judicious. Cause if I didn't, if I spent all my time just rebutting what the jury said, then I'm talking about what the defense wants to talk about. I want to talk about what I want to talk about, what my jurors need to do to go win. So, you know, I got this from David Ball. One thing I like to do is have a chart. Like, if you're in the jury room and someone says this, remind them this. So, you know, if someone says, well, the car doesn't look that damaged, remind them that people get hurt all the time when there's not a lot of property damage. If someone said, well, what the defense doctor said, they had degeneration. Remind them that the pain didn't start until the day of the crash. The pain wasn't there before. You know, just whatever it is, just you come up with those little things to remind them. I think that's really helpful because, again, you're in the often they'll take notes and start writing it down. And it gives your juror, your jurors who not are not professional debaters. You give them the tools they need to go argue your case. Then if the defense, especially if they really misrepresent something and I can put up a piece, put up an exhibit and show that they're just full of crap. I think that always helps to make them lose credibility. But then the, the last thing is at the end, I really have to empower them. Sometimes I just flat out say, you can be heroes, you can save the day. One case I had an active duty Marine as my jury foreman. I was just looking him in the eye like, you can, you, you know, you need to go fight for this person. You need to be a hero. And he was like nodding right with me. Uh, I knew I had him. They, they didn't strike him because of demographics, but I knew I had him in Vordire. We just really clicked and he said some great things. And he went in there and fought for us. And, you know, we got a nice, I mean, wasn't like a TOU big verdict. It was a million and a quarter, but the pretrial offer was only 125000 We had 
34,000 in meds we didn't submit. We we're, we're happy with it. Last trial, I did yeah. the two futures clothing. You know, you're trying to show the jury that what they do is going to be a, make a difference. And so my client who lost his leg is studying to become a mechanical engineer. And his goal was to be a PhD. So I'm like, you know, we've talked a lot about the last 30 years and everything the company's known for the last 30 years, all the people that got hurt the last 30 years, all the things the company didn't do the last 30 years. Let's take a second and think about the next 30 years. I want you to imagine that it's 2053. And Dr. Christopher Zeski, because I believe in my heart he's going to get that PhD, working on prosthetics to help other amputees. He wants to look back and say, and find out, did what I went through, did it make any difference? And so he's going to go look at the same OSHA databases that you heard the, the experts talk about, and he's going to see how many people are getting their feet crushed on these stand-up forklifts. Is it still hundreds of people losing their legs? Or did something happen in 2023 that something changed and now 30 years from now, these injuries have gone to zero. They're not happening anymore. What he's going to find is up to you. So get, make, make them feel like what they're doing makes a difference in the world. It's got to be more than just about your client. Speaking of making a difference in the world, I know you you do besides trying cases, you do a little bit of teaching yourself beyond TL, you know, b- before TL use. And yeah. So you have a, a big rig boot camp. Is yes. that right? July twelfth in San Antonio. I I do a uh, six to seven hours uh, of talking about trucking. We 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 throw an hour ethics in there because everybody always needs their ethics credit. But we make it fun. We make it's a game show. It's ethics Jeopardy. You can enter and then you get prizes if you're you know one of the one of the people that does it. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, we, we, I, I do a deep dive into well, how to work up a trucking case. And this year it's going to be really cool because, uh, there's something called telematics, which is like GPS and video and stuff that trucking companies can use to monitor their drivers, to set up rules for the, like the speeds, how, how hard they can break. And we actually bought a telematic system and we're working with our experts. So we're going to show you like, this is the, what the company sees. This is what the company can do. When you do this, this is what shows up. Uh, same for cheating on uh, electronic logs. We're going to show, like, if the driver does this to cheat on the log, what message does the company get? So when they claim they don't know, like, this is how to catch them cheating. This is what the company sees. You know, it's just, and I love all the other programs where I speak, but I usually get 30 minutes or an hour, and I get assigned a topic. And, and those are all great programs. But the what I love about my boot camp, it really lets me dive in and share things that I just don't get an opportunity to share at other conferences where I only have 30 minutes to an hour. And, you know, we've... We had about right under 200 people this year. We're open for, you know, more than 200 this coming uh, 2024. You know, people love it. It's super cheap. We, we only charge a little something because when it was free, there were people that would take the seat because we sell out usually. They would take the seat. Someone else wouldn't be able to come and something would come up and they wouldn't show up. Uh, and so, you know, we, so we charge like $199. It's super duper cheap just because, you know, I want to, and we serve food and it's have a happy hour. It's a great fun. Uh, but it's also, you know, a great learning experience. And then we will have time for question and answer too, if you have anything on your cases. Well, just so you know, if you need more time in Las Vegas and you want to do a more in-depth deep dive, we have the space. And because in Vegas is October 16th through 19th. So it's going to be, uh, usually there's one track that's trucking that, you know, with your, but you were, you know, you were there last in 2022. And uh, that was a good program. We had about 1,200 people in Vegas, but we're doing a Caesars Palace this year. Yeah. October 16th through 19th. So if I'm not in trial, I would love to go. Uh, it's just, just right move now. Move your trial. What? Move your trial. Come on. This is TLU Vegas. Like every yeah, judge will uh, understand it, that. It's a 17 vehicle pileup case with tons, oh. of, uh, tons of different plaintiff lawyers. I, I don't know. We've resolved it with all but three of the defendants. So we'll see what happens between now and then. But uh, I, I would love to be there, but. Yeah, you know, I love trying cases too. <laughs> That's... Yeah, save the date. <laughs> oh, and speaking of ethics, maybe you, if you're interested, you can do an ethics hour like you did with your game show that make it interesting, and then I'd have I'd have an actual ethics hour of credit on TLU on demand. Oh, I'd love to do that and make it interesting. The whole thing is it's got to be practical and interesting because I, I I've, I've just been like so glassy eyed with some of these ethics presentations that are just boring oh, brutal. and not practical. I mean, most people are just. You know, to get their ethics, either they sign up for it and never go, or they log on to the computer. <laughs> it's a biased thing. They log on to their to to some ethics provider and just 
have their associate hit the button every time, which is unethical. It's so yeah. funny. They force people to do unethical things to get their ethics credits. It's crazy. I'm also licensed in New Mexico, and for, for their ethics, it, you either have to be in person where you're physically there and sign in and out, or you have to do it where there's some interactive component where the presenter asks you questions. So it's like uh, two years in a row, I've needed like one ethics hour at the end of it. Because I get one from the boot camp, but I need one more. And so I sign up for this telephone one where the guy says, well, we're talking about professionalism. And he goes around the whole list of you. What does professionalism mean to you? And he asks one person at a time. And he comes up with another question. He asks one person at a time. And we do that on the phone until the two hours is up. And it is just so painful. It sounds brutal. Yeah. So if you and I sounds will do something brutal. ethical uh, and we'll make it fun. Uh, and I'm looking forward to it. I look forward to it. And I look forward to doing a case analysis after this next trial you do. So it's all fresh in your mind. You don't yeah. have to talk about, oh, it's a lot because, you know, some people, sometimes people don't want to do these things like, you know, six months after because they're like, oh, it's so much work to put it all together. I'm like, I know, to sit back and that's why we try to do it when they're hot off the press. Hot off the yeah, press. Well, hopefully all right, I, hopefully Michael, I go. Let... The, the, the defense is begging for continuance. We're begging to go. We'll find out. We have to get down there Monday morning and the judge will tell us whether or not she grants a continuance, but we're going to be ready. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping. Win, lose, or draw, I want to get it tried and hopefully it's a win, but no matter what, I want to have fun doing it. That's the right attitude because... And I... Uh, also, that, I forgot to say... That's why uh, it's called trying a case. That's right. Not, it's and not called winning say, a case. It's called trying a case because these things yep. can sometimes happen. I prefer to win it, but no matter what, I'm going to try and have fun with it. <laughs> I forgot to say with my boot you camp, if, you, if anyone wants to look, check into it, it's bigrigbootcamp.com. So. Oh, yes. And you also have your own podcast with oh, the same yeah. podcasting host. The name of it's Trial Lawyer Nation? Yeah, we're on all the podcast apps. So just Google Trial Lawyer Nation or go into your Apple podcast, your other podcast apps, Spotify, whatever it is, and just enter in Trial Lawyer Nation and you'll find us. Perfect. We always enjoy shameless plugs. and Absolutely. And, yeah. I will plug myself. See that? Perfect. It stars go on their back. Yeah. It's crazy. That's pretty funny. All right. <laughs> well, we're all set here. Thanks for visiting and good luck. Get ready for trial. And I look forward to hearing about the results and doing a webinar on it when you're done. So, what's today? Today's only what? Today's Tuesday. The 30th, yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. I'm headed out to New Orleans tomorrow for the Southern Trial Lawyers. Oh, fine. And then the Austin for AAJ, so I'll be in your yeah, great if state. Not, if I'm not in trial, I'll be at AAJ Monday and Tuesday. I, I had uh, promised my wife we're going to go see my son in college, who's a freshman in college, that weekend before. Uh, whether I'm in trial or not, I have to go. It's crazy, but uh, I want to stay married, too. Uh, but I, <laughs> if I'm not in draw, I'll be there for the Monday and Tuesday. So I'll, I'll find you. All right. I hope to see you. Take care. Thanks. And thanks for visiting. Ready to train with the Titans and set records with your verdicts? Register for our live conferences and boot camps at triallawyersuniversity.com. Start getting your reps in before the big event by going to tluondemand.com to gain instant access to live lectures, case analysis, and skills training videos from the trial lawyer champions you love and respect, as well as pleadings, transcripts, PowerPoints, and notes for a roadmap to victory. Join the group that continues to get extraordinary results. Trial Lawyers University, produced and powered by LawPods.